Good evening, and welcome to another in Metrolinx's ongoing series of online open houses for the Ontario line. My name is Joseph Thornley, and I'm the CEO of 76 Engage, Metrolinx's public engagement partner for virtual consultation. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this evening's event, and as such, I'll try and keep the event on time, ensure your questions are answered as fully as possible, and make sure as many questions are answered as possible. One important note, this event is being closed captioned. To use this feature, enable it on your uh, video player by clicking on the CC at the bottom of the video screen. As we begin this evening's event, please let's take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of Indigenous people, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers and immigrants in this generation or generations past. Metrolinx declares its commitment to building meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the historic and continued impacts of colonialization and the need to work towards meaningful reconciliation with the original caretakers of this land. We acknowledge that Metrolinx operates on lands covered by 20 treaties and that we have a responsibility to recognize and value the rights of Indigenous nations and peoples and conduct business in a manner that is built on the foundation of trust, respect, and collaboration. It's a Metrolinx tradition to be concerned with safety. So as we uh, begin tonight's session, let's take a second to think about our loved ones, the people that we'll be with at this special time of year. Everyone's excited to see friends and family, but please take some time to think about safety measures and precautions to ensure that everyone has a safe holiday season. Now, this evening, Metrolinx is going to be providing an overview of the work that has taken a place along the Ontario line this year, and we'll give you an update on what lies ahead next year. We've scheduled this session to last an hour and a half, so we'll be going until about 8 p.m. There'll be a presentation by the Metrolink staff, and then we'll take as many questions as possible. As you can see, at the bottom of your screen uh, is a question and answer session, if you just scroll down below the video, and a number of people have already asked written questions. Take a minute to vote for the questions that you would most like to have asked. After the presentation, I'll select from those questions. I'll start with the most voted for questions and I'll reach a bit further down so as to make sure that the major subject areas that you've expressed your concerns about are addressed in, those, in that question and answer session. Then, for the second half of the question and answer session, we have the opportunity for you to ask your questions orally. We have a Zoom room, again, right under the video on your screen. If you just scroll down, there's a little box that says call in with your question and a yellow join Zoom room. You can uh, click on that button to go to the Zoom room and your microphone can be enabled when you want to ask a question. Uh, uh, and Daryl and Siva are there, and they'll be your moderators for that part of the evening. Again, if you've just joined us, the event is being closed captioned. To use this feature, enable it on your video player by clicking on the CC at the bottom of the video screen. I'd now like to introduce your panel for presentation and questions. First up, Malcolm Mackay is the program sponsor for the Ontario Line Project. With him is Richard Tucker, the Vice President Subway Project Delivery for the Ontario Line. James Francis is a manager on Metrolinx's Environmental Programs and Assessment Team. Franca Di Giovanni is a Director of Community Relations for the Toronto Capital Projects. And Natasha Dalal is a senior manager on the property acquisition team. Welcome, Malcolm, Richard, James, Franca, and Natasha.
I also want to take a moment just before the presentation to recognize the elected officials and or their staff who have joined us uh, today, including uh, representatives and or MPP Glover, Councillor Fletcher and MP Rob Oliphant. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to take you on a 15.6 kilometer journey from uh, the west end of the Ontario line all the way through to the Ontario Science Centre. Um, this first segment, uh, working from the west, is our west segment. It includes stations at Exhibition, King and Bathurst, and Queen and Spadina. Um, those three stations uh, what are what constitute um, the, uh, the Western alignment and the Western segment. Next slide. So exhibition, uh, that is the uh, location of the existing exhibition station. We're going to have an Ontario line station here for a very important interchange uh, with the uh, GO Transit system. We're expecting very high ridership here, almost 12,000 total. Uh, boardings and alightings in the AM peak with almost over 6,000 uh, transfers to and from the Lakeshore West Go Line. This is a very important uh, station in that it serves Liberty Village and the South Parkdale and Niagara communities as well, uh, the vibrant uh, exhibition place. We're coordinating quite well with the City of Toronto uh, and the exhibition place in TTC as our community partners to uh, plan this station and the implementation of it in a coordinated fashion with all of the events, the fantastic events that are happening down at exhibition. Next slide. So our station is actually on the north side of the uh, Gardner Expressway. It is uh, straddling over top of the existing GO line and it's going to be linking quite closely to uh, Liberty Village and uh, the BIA, the business uh, area, um, north of the uh, Gardner Expressway. Next slide. I'm going to pass it to Richard for a discussion on the construction, the early construction works. Thanks, Malcolm. So this is uh, the early construction works at Exhibition are going to be laying the groundwork for the uh, South Civils contractor will be coming along. Um, we expect the work in this area to start uh, towards the end of this year in December. Uh, we should start seeing the contractor on site here. Um, the work here is basically um, recommissioning this uh, head house you see here in the picture uh, to allow um, access across underneath the tracks. Um, while that's in, in being commissioned, uh, further to the north, you'll see the building behind there in, in brick uh red brick with the big windows and that's one atlantic and that that will be making way for a new north entrance uh that will be an extension from this tunnel uh, that will be going on in parallel with that we will be moving the uh tracks to the north two of the go tracks to the north to make way for a new center platform for go um, and we will be relocating the platforms slightly to the east to allow for the construction of the new station um, on top of that there's a, a new pedestrian bridge I, you know in in certain when uh, the crowds start coming back to uh, exhibition and the uh, the soccer stadium there there'll be uh, you know there's been a little bit of a, a crowding and on the tunnel going underneath the track so we've recognized that and as part of this work we'll be creating a new te temporary pedestrian bridge uh temporary you know kind of 10 years long type temporary to allow for additional capacity in crossing the railway um next slide please so here you have a bird's eye view looking from the west towards the east. You'll see the uh, CN Tower in the background there and Lake Ontario to the right, uh, along with the Gardner Expressway. And you can see in the center of the frame, you can see the GO tracks have been spread apart uh, with the new GO platforms. And you can see that new pedestrian bridge going over the top uh, to, uh, the, to the north side, connecting the north and south sides of the railway corridor. Now, un going underneath the bridge, uh, just to the north or to the left of the GO trains is the access to the where the new Ontario line alignment will be going. And this, this separation of pedestrians allows us to cr create this construction uh, while completely separated from pedestrians in the area and to ensure the maximum safety for anybody who happens to live or work in this area. Next slide, please. 
I think that's back to Malcolm. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, so now we continue west uh, to the corner of King and Bathurst. Uh, this is uh, within an easy 10 minute walk of uh, Fort York uh, with over 27,000 residents and 24,000 jobs in this area. This is a vital uh, station for the Ontario line. It has very important transfers with the uh, 504 King streetcar, as well as the 511 Bathurst streetcar to provide some extra resiliency to the surface transit network and a very important uh, relief function. The next slide. So at King and Bathurst, we'll have two entrances, one on the northeast corner and one on the southeast corner of uh, King and Bathurst. And uh, those two uh, entrances uh, will provide great connectivity with the existing streetcars that are operating in this area. Next slide. So now we continue further east uh, from uh, King and Bathurst to Queen and Spadina. This is the home to 22,800 residents and 41,000 jobs. Uh, there's very high ridership here with over 7200 during the peak am period it's also a very important uh, link with the ttc surface transit network the 501 queen streetcar as well as the 510 spadina streetcar and will also once again provide resiliency and relief to the surface transportation network this is also a, a, a great access to kensington place uh, alexandra park and wellington place Next slide. So our, um, our entrances here are on the uh, northeast corner as well as the uh, southwest corner of Queen and Spadina. And once again, these uh, uh, station entrances are ideally suited to the um, uh, surface transit network and easy transfers from those streetcars. Next slide. So what's next for the uh, West segment? Well, as Richard said, uh, construction and exhibition is expected to begin uh, at the end of this year and into 2022. Um, as we're developing the uh, traffic management plans around those constructions, we'll be sharing that uh, with the community. As well at the two uh, stations, King and Bathurst, Queen and Spadina, we're gonna start looking at uh, uh, utility relocations, which will start in early 2022 and uh, are expected to uh, continue through early 2023. There's transit-oriented communities uh, located in this area, and we uh, encourage you to visit the Infrastructure Ontario site, engageio.ca, if you'd like to learn more about the transit-oriented communities in this area. Next slide. So now we go to the next section of our, uh, our Ontario line. After uh, Queen and Spadina, we come to Osgood, Queen, Moss Park, and Cork Down, which we call the downtown segment. Next slide. So at Osgood, we have over 12,000 uh, uh, peak ridership, uh, boardings and alightings. Uh, this is a very important uh, transfer station with uh, line one, with almost 5,700 transfers to or from line one. We've located the station directly below the existing Osgood station to make sure that those transfers are easy and uh, and very well coordinated with the surface transit network that runs along Queen Street. Next slide. We have two new uh, entrances that are being built, one on the uh, northeast corner in Osgood Hall. Uh, we recognize that this is a, an important heritage site and we've gone to great lengths to try and integrate this station entrance into the site, maintaining the oh so important fences that ring Osgood Hall. Uh, this will be a, a wonderful addition to, uh, to the community here and uh, provide access to this vital uh, business area. We also have a second entrance on the south side of Queen Street, which will also provide uh, excellent connectivity with the uh, surface transit network and the 501 streetcar. Next slide. 
So over to Queen. Queen is our busiest station in the un- entire alignment in the AM peak. This is where uh, a lot of people will be coming, over 16,600 in the AM peak hour for boardings and alightings. It's also a very important transfer station with line one, and it serves the uh, financial district as well as the downtown young uh, business improvement area. Next slide. We have multiple entrances and exits at this location, and it is one of our hardest stations to build. Uh, it's, there's a great deal of density on each corner, um, and in this area, we're going to be using a form of construction that is, is called an open cut, and we'll be uh, talking about the uh, street closures in a few moments. Next slide. You can see here that uh, the new Queen Station is going to be very deep. It's going to be directly below the existing line one so that there'll be great uh, connectivity and easy transfers, which are very important. And uh, again, uh, like all things related to transit, uh, time is is very is vital. And uh, this transfer will save over a minute on every single uh, transfer that occurs here versus the alternative siting, which was uh, a little bit further west of here and not directly below uh, the uh, Queen existing Queen uh, station. Next slide. Richard, would you like to talk about the uh, construction and the bypasses uh, uh, around Queen, Queen Station? Sure, happy to, Malcolm. So uh, one of the uh, key aspects of the work we do is to, is to ensure that the uh, everybody can still get around on a day-to-day basis and that disruptions are held to an absolute minimum. To this end, we've uh, planned a detour of the Queen streetcar uh, around this work, at, uh, which will allow passengers to just continue on, to, on the streetcar just like they would if they traveled through this area normally. Um, so basically what's happening is the uh, if you're traveling uh, eastbound, um, basically you will head uh, down, down, come to church, uh, go down one block and then along Richmond uh, over to York and then northbound uh, up back to Queen, just like the diversion is uh, happening, uh, would happen today. Uh, further to that, if you're heading the other way, some new infrastructure will head down south on York Street along Adelaide and then over to church and then back up church and back onto Queen. So it's pretty much, it's a seamless route um, and will allow for uh, those passengers who ride through this area just to continue riding without having to get on and off the streetcar to go through the area. And this is expected to take about four and a half years. Um, The the big advantage of closing the uh, Queen Street in this area is to uh, shorten the amount of time it takes to to uh, to build in the station. Uh, We expect it knocks off about uh, a year of construction time and uh, probably accelerates the opening of the Ontario line by about six months overall, because this is one of the longest stations to build in the network as it's one of the most complex and longest uh, to to build. Um, With that, back to you, Malcolm. Thank you, Richard. Next slide. So what to expect at Queen Station? Uh, Well, over the uh, remaining part of of this year, we'll be uh, continuing with consultations with the elected officials and the community. Uh, We're uh, expecting a report to be going to the December 15-16 Toronto Council. Because this closure is over 365 days, uh, we would be seeking council approval for this. Um, We'll also be starting the uh, works at um, uh, Hudson Bay uh, in uh, mid-2022 and uh, be performing some uh, gas and hydro uh, utility relocations in the winter of 2022. Uh, In 2023, the major construction will begin on the uh, civil stations and tunnels as well as the tracks. which is the big contracts that are being tendered currently. Next slide. We continue uh, moving east uh, to uh, Moss Park. This is a a very important station. It serves uh, Regent Park and the Garden District and St. Lawrence Market. It too has uh, exceptional uh, ridership at uh, 7,300 total boardings and alightings. And we're working quite closely with the city on the uh, impacts to Moss Park as a result 
construction, as well as coordinating with the uh, very important community recreation centers that are uh, in development uh, for this park and how they can be all integrated together as well as the existing arena. Next slide. So Moss Park has uh, has one entrance. It's on the cor north uh, west corner of uh, Sherburn and Queen. And uh, once again, we're working quite closely with the city to make sure that the arena and the future uh, community uh, recreation center uh, is uh, is are all well linked and connected to transit. Next slide. So now we continue uh, east and south down into the station that's called Corktown. Uh, there we have uh, excellent uh, access to the distillery district, uh, St. Lawrence Mar Market, as well as uh, Corktown. Uh, there's over 26,000 residents in this neighborhood and it will serve over 15,000 jobs within the comfortable 10 minute walk of Corktown. Corktown's an exciting station because there's a lot of work that's going on there right now. Next slide. So right now we're, uh, we, uh, we're planning the uh, entrance to be on the north parcel of land. Uh, construction staging for the tunnel boring machines are going to be out of the uh, south parcels of land that you can see here. And uh, we're very actively right now performing some archaeological digs on the site that is called the First Parliament Site of Canada. Next slide. I'll pass this to uh, Richard to talk about the early construction works and demolition. Thanks, Malcolm. So uh, essentially, as you can see here, that the uh, Corktown is actually uh, two sites that are on either side of Front Street East, uh, one between Front and King, and the other one between uh, essentially the Esplanade or the park there and Front Street. Uh, the one on the north side, as you can see in the picture on the right, which is looking towards the northwest from the from the southeast. You can see the staples and there's the car dealership there. Um, those, those will be demolished. Uh, there will be archeological work that goes on there as preparatory work getting ready for the arrival of uh, our Project Code South Civils Construction Company. Um, and then on the south, as Malcolm was talking about, this is where the staging area will be for the uh, tunnel boring machines. And again, you can see some buildings on there. There's some parking lots, uh, a car dealership, a car wash, and some various other buildings uh, that will be demolished as well as part of the, uh, as, as over the next uh, coming months, uh, starting, starting approximately now, uh, through the uh, summer of next year. Um, and with that, there's a, a whole, in uh, very intensive archaeological program that uh, I'm sure James will be pleased to bring us up to date on. Over to you, James. Great. Th thanks very much, Richard. Uh, so, so, so as Richard and Malcolm both mentioned, uh, we do have an ongoing archaeological investigation at, at the First Parliament site right now, uh, and, and, and we have had some interesting finds to date. So for, for those who may not know, this site, it, it's located in a part of the city that was known to have been used by Indigenous peoples prior to colonial settlement, and it was also the home of Upper Canada's first and second second Parliament buildings. After that, home to the Home District Jail, and then consumers' gas facilities prior to uh, more modern-day automotive-related uses. Uh, so, to date, our archaeological investigations on the site they've uh, uncovered remains associated with early Toronto industry, including railway tracks and a railway turntable. Uh, and, and the railway turntables is what's shown on the slide here, as our as our crews are are uncovering it. And that turntable would have been used by locomotives accessing the site. So our, our archaeological investigations are very much underway and they'll be continuing this fall until the ground freezes and, and will resume in the spring. And as the work advances, we're, we're very much looking forward to sharing our findings with the community and exploring commemorative opportunities about the past uses of the site. And so on, on that note, I'd like to encourage anyone who, who's interested in the history of this site to participate in our Heritage Interpretation and Commemoration Plan Survey. Uh, in this survey, we're collecting feedback on which heritage themes associated with this with this site should be presented in the future Ontario Line station. And uh, this work, it, it builds on, on some excellent work that was done by the city in their uh, heritage interpretation strategy and master plan for the site, uh, with, with which you know fo so some folks may be familiar. Uh, we've recently published a short video, which is available on our website, that introduces the, the identified heritage themes and the survey 
about the commemoration themes is live on our website until December 17th, and I very much encourage participation in the survey. So thank you very much, and, uh, and back to you, Richard. Okay, great. Thanks, James. That's very interesting stuff. Next slide, please. Okay, so the Lower Don Bridge. This is uh, the, the Ontario line uh, crosses from uh, East Harbor, which you can see on the uh, left side of this image here uh, with the old soap factory, um, crossing uh, the Don Valley Parkway and the Don River and moving over to the Don Yard on the right side of the image. Uh, this bridge, uh, it almost uh, looks like it's there already, is a tide arch bridge, some 180 meter clear span. So it actually uh, goes from where you see the arch touch the ground on both sides. There's no supports in between there. So it's a very long span bridge and this was done to ensure uh, that, to make sure that there was no interference with the drainage patterns of the Don River and to allow for uh, all that, uh, to ensure that there's no, no blockage or anything, any changes to the, uh, the floodplain in this area. Um, it's also a very elegant uh, structure, and I think it's, it's going to be a great gateway for, for the downtown, for people coming, coming from the north and uh, getting onto the, uh, onto the uh, Gardner Expressway. So um, we're basically currently in, in, in working through, we've had some uh, initial RFQs and we've had some expressions of interest from various contractors who are looking at uh, building the abutments for this bridge. Um, we're currently uh, getting ready to issue the construction tender for this and uh, aiming to award uh, in the first part of 2022. And uh, we're aiming to start construction on this work uh, in, in the middle to latter half of next year. Uh, next slide, please. And this, uh, the, the bridge, which you can uh, kind of see in, in purple there, crossing across the Don Valley and the Don River, um, leads into the Don Yard, what we call the Don Yard, which is, uh, some of you may be familiar with, uh, you know, riding the GO train from, from the east into Union Station. You go through the Don Yard, you see all those storage tracks where the GO trains are. Um, essentially, the, uh, the Ontario line enters into that area and then goes below ground for the trip through the downtown. Um, and as such, we have to kind of uh, pry those tracks apart a little bit to allow us some room to move into there. And there's uh, a, a lot of work that will be going on in the Don Yard to allow that, um, starting with uh, sliding the current tracks to the south a little bit and also sliding the Richmond Hill tracks a little bit to the north uh, to allow for a little, little bit of an opening in there. Um, that work is expected to uh, start uh, imminently and uh, will proceed over the next, uh, next few years. And it includes a uh, retaining wall um, and embankment on the north side, um, and also includes a portal, which is essentially where the track goes from at grade down below into the tunnel and enters the tunnel. Um, just to the uh, west of the Don River Bridge. So you come across the bridge and then you'll start going down into the portal. Um, in the little image on the uh, left there, you can see a, a view of the uh, pathway that currently heads under the Go Bridge there and uh, will be spanned by the new Don River Bridge we looked at in the previous slide. Um, so all these works will be taking place over the next few years to pave the way for uh, RSSOM. This is uh, complicated and high risk work in terms of uh, from a contractor's viewpoint, not necessarily from a safety viewpoint, but from the contractor's viewpoint, because there's a lot of moving parts in terms of trying to, to move into uh, the, this area of a working railway and make sure that it happens as seamlessly and effectively and as safely as possible. Uh, next slide, please. And I think that's back to Malcolm. Yeah, thank you, Richard. A very interesting work down there at uh, the, the Don Yard and the, the Don River Crossing. Um, so what's up next for the downtown segment? Well, uh, as James said, the first Parliament Heritage Interpretation and Commemoration Plan Themes Survey uh, is open until December 17th, and we encourage you to visit us at metrolinksengage.com backslash Ontario line to share your, your thoughts on the survey. Um, construction tech work down, as Richard said, will begin in 2022 after the archaeological investigation is complete. Uh, that archaeological investigation is, is just fantastic. It's, uh, uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, next spring when they uh, open up even more of the site and see what we uncover there. 
Um, we also talked about the uh, Queen Street closure, and there's a fair bit of work that has to happen on Adelaide Street in order for TTC to be able to run their streetcar network on Adelaide. And we'll be working quite closely with the city and TTC to implement that early next year. Um, as, as we develop, the, uh, the, the project company joins us and starts putting together their traffic management plans. We'll be communicating those and consulting with the community uh, with those uh, plans. Um, further refinement of the property requirements uh, will be will continue and the owners will be identified and and of course uh, as as with uh, many of the downtown stations there's a transit oriented community opportunity and once again we encourage you to visit infrastructures engage io.ca site to uh, learn more about the transit uh, oriented communities in this area next slide so now we continue across the uh, the Don River uh, east towards East Harbour. Next slide. Here we'll go through the East Harbour Station and the important uh, development that's happening there, and then the community of uh, Riverside and Leslieville up to Girard. Next slide. At East Harbour, there's a, a very large development that's happening in Structure Ontario and the Ministry of Transportation are, are deeply engaged with the, the City of Toronto and the development community, uh, making this 38-acre site into a new transit-oriented community with more than 50,000 jobs and more than 5,800 residents to be uh, within a comfortable 10-minute uh, walk. Of this, uh, of this site. It's also a very important interchange station with the GO Transit network, and we're expecting uh, 14,900 um, ridership uh, in the busiest hour in the AM peak period. Next slide. And the construction at uh, East Harbor is uh, going to be undertaken by our uh, Go Transit uh, uh, project delivery team. Um, it's going to involve the replacement of the Eastern Avenue Rail Bridge to accommodate the uh, new uh, Go tracks heading north, uh, as well as grading, demolition, and upgrade of the existing structures and the building of the new interchange station between uh, the Ontario Line and the Go Transit network. Next slide. As we move further uh, east and north, we come to the uh, Riverside Leslieville station. Uh, it's a very popular connection with the 501 streetcar and will provide some network resiliency and relief to the 501 streetcar to provide an alternative, uh, attractive way to get downtown. Uh, there's over 9,500 residents and almost 7,000 jobs within this walking, 10 minute walking distance. And, we expect ridership of over 4,000 uh, people per hour during the busiest hour. Next slide, and Richard, you can talk about our construction and uh, uh, adjacent to the Jimmy Simpson Recreation Centre and Park. Yeah, thanks, Malcolm. So what you see on the screen here in front of you is a cross section through the railway. It's a it's a, through the joint corridor, as we call it, which is where the go. Uh, go system and the Ontario line system will be sharing the corridor in the future. Uh, this particular cross section is taken uh, in the vicinity of the Jimmy Simpson uh, Community Centre. Um, it's this is representative, of course, as as you move east and west on the uh, on the system on the guideway, um, you'll the section will change in width. It, it gets narrower in places and gets wider in other places, depending on the uh, you know the curves and the arrangement of uh, where there's stations and those kind of things. Um, as you can see here, but they all depending where you are, they you know regardless of the width, they kind of share uh, a very uh, very similar uh, topography. Um, essentially, you can see the four GO train tracks uh, on the right-hand side of the image. So that's kind of on the south or east side of the corridor. Um, as you know, there's currently three tracks in the corridor, and they, these will be moved to the to the south and east um, on top of uh, retaining walls. The retaining walls are basically what we call a T wall, which is kind of a very interesting idea. You think of, of a T like this, but kind of laid down on its side. 
And uh, that allows us to construct the railway corridor, the joint corridor, as you see it here, from entirely from within the corridor. So that uh, minimizing any effect on any surrounding properties or parks, uh, which we all know is very important to the neighborhood here. Um, also, you can see that one of the advantages of the system of retaining walls is that uh, we're actually able to reduce the extent of the railway corridor in some areas and actually give some air, some land back to the parks in the areas, which uh, is a very important attribute. Um, as you can see on the left hand side of the image, there's the Ontario line. Uh, at this point, the uh, trains are a little bit spread apart because they're just about to enter into the uh, Lessieville station. Um, and uh, you can see again, same topology with the uh, retaining walls. And then on top of the retaining walls is the noise walls uh, to mitigate uh, any any noise in this area. And uh, I think, um, you know, my understanding is basically from the environmental team that in general, they're, they're actually an improvement over the current situation with uh, the three GO trains uh, just sitting on top of the embankment. Um, and uh, Essentially, I think those are the key features that you can see in a cross section. And I think that's uh, back to Malcolm, I believe. Yes, uh, thank you, Richard. Um, next slide. So one of the things that uh, we've been highlighting at uh, some of our previous virtual open houses is the fact that uh, the parks through this uh, joint corridor area are actually going to get larger in size as a result of the uh, building of the Ontario line. There's almost uh, 2,600 uh, square meters of additional park space that are going to be added to McCleary Playground, Jimmy Simpson Park, Bruce Mackey Park, and the Gerard uh, Carla Parkette and Dog Park. Um, we've been uh, working quite closely with uh, the City of Toronto to try and identify what sort of uh, programming spaces might be available as a result of this added park space. And we'll be coming out to the community and getting your input and uh, evaluating the uh, the best uh, uses, highest uses for this additional new asset that's going to be given to the City of Toronto. Next slide. So we continue north and east uh, to uh, Gerard and uh, and Carla where uh, the uh, new uh, Girard station is going to be built. It has uh, easy connections to the 506 Carlton Streetcar and the very important 72 Pay bus. A very great number of residents and jobs within the comfortable 10 minute walk of the station uh, with ridership of 3,300 during its busiest hour. Um, this is also a location where um, we're in order to build this uh, station, we're going to be occupying the uh, dog park there. So we'll be working quite closely with the community and the city of Toronto to uh, find an alternative temporary location for that dog park that's uh, adjacent and near to this one. And it may in fact become a second dog park. The uh, added space that we're adding at the Gerard uh, Carla dark dog park is almost 500 uh, square meters. So uh, when we reinstate it, uh, we'll be certainly working with you, the community, to put in place the right solution here. Next slide. You may have also seen on our website and previous virtual open houses that uh, we've done extensive modeling of the uh, sound levels. Um, and what we found is that the sound levels are, uh, are generally going to be the same or lower with the uh, future noise barriers. And we've opened up a website, ontariolinesoundstudio.ca backslash listen, where you can listen to the sound demos and compare existing noise levels with uh, the future noise levels with and without the Ontario line. We've also added uh, demonstrations for Jimmy Simpson Park and Tiverton Parkette. So uh, go there and, uh, and check it out. It, it is really quite a, an interesting uh, listen and uh, you will see that uh, the, the wonderful things that uh, are made available because of the investment that's going to happen in, in sound and noise wall uh, barriers through this area. Next slide. So what's uh, coming up next for uh, this segment? Well, the uh, early works reports for East Harbor and Lakeshore East Corridor are now available at our Metrolinks Engage uh, website. Uh, the survey results for the new noise wall and retaining wall, which we reached out to the community in our last virtual open house, 
will be published at the end of this year, and they will uh, then feed into a community engagement so that we can identify the very best solutions for the retaining wall, noise wall, and future park, park services. Um, the vegetation removal um, for the Ontario line will begin in 2022. Um, the Go Expansion uh, vegetation removals are currently underway north of here. And uh, the East um, Lakeshore Joint Corridor construction will begin in 2022. Um, our property requirements, as, as always, are being refined and owners are being notified as we're advancing the work. And the very important environmental impact assessment report for the entire project is going to be issued in January of 2022. Next slide. So now we're heading uh, north to the north segment, which is defined as the uh, PAPE to Science Center section of the alignment. Next slide. So from Girard, we'll be going underground to uh, the Minton Place, where they'll be building the uh, Minton Place portal. We'll be building PAPE Station and Cosburn Station. And then we'll be crossing the Don Valley with a, a new bridge and uh, come into the very important Thorncliffe Park uh, area and then Flemington Park and up to the Ontario Science Centre. We'll be building a new maintenance and storage facility on the north side of uh, Thorncliffe Park and the south side of the Wicksteed industrial area. Next slide. So as you can see here, the north tunneled section uh, begins at uh, Girard, runs through PAPE. PAPE is a very important station to us. It is actually where the main relief to line one is generated. So building a very attractive transfer here for the Ontario line with the uh, line two is to encourage people to get out of their seats uh, riding line two and make that transfer to the Ontario line and its fully automated trains in order to get downtown faster and avoid the uh, Young Bluer station, the very big congestion that's there. We're expecting almost 25% relief um, in at Young Bluer station as a result of the Ontario line. Next slide. So Pape Station, as I described, is, a, is, is the very busy um, interchange station with uh, over 12,000 people within walking distance. It's a vibrant community with uh, a great nightlife and, and uh, great uh, fairs and, and, and street festivals. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's an important area and it's an important station. And uh, we're, we're spending the time right now to uh, design it very well. Um, it is a challenging station because we are going underneath the existing line two PAPE station. Um, but, you know, stay stay tuned. Uh, we're going to be coming out with more information on this station as the design develops uh, uh, further. Next slide. As we head north uh, from PAPE station, we go through Cosburn station, which we will also update you on uh, early next year. But uh, we've also uh, done a rendering of the Don Valley Crossing. You can see that we're coming out of the Minton Place portal on the right. Uh, and we've had a significant uh, engagement with the uh, Pape Avenue Concerned Citizens for Transit uh, group uh, that are, are residents of this area and uh, been working quite closely with them to ensure that the construction and final outcome of the building of transit in this area um, is the best outcome possible. Next slide. As we come across uh, the uh, the, the uh, Don Valley, we're on an elevated uh, guideway as we pass through Thorncliffe Park and continue uh, across the uh, Don Valley again to Flemington Park and up to the Science Centre. The uh, maintenance and storage facility shown in purple is where the Ontario Line trains are housed and maintained and serviced each day. And as we described, it uh, occupies the space on the north side of uh, Overly Boulevard um, in Thorncliffe Park and the south side of the Wicksteed area. An interchange station at the Ontario Science Centre with the uh, Eglinton Crosstown Line 5 will provide further relief, um, this time being at the uh, very important Young and Eglinton station over on Line 1. Next slide. 
the elevated tracks and guideway uh, through Thorncliffe Park, Flemington Park, and up into the Science Centre uh, will be separated from vehicles and pedestrians and will provide safe and reliable service. Um, we're designing this with uh, the uh, community in mind to make sure that it fits into the community. It creates opportunities below the structures for public spaces uh, in order to animate and, and, and create a more of a Main Street environment along Overly. Um, we are and have been uh, seeking community input on the design priorities and we'll continue to do that throughout uh, 2022 so that uh, when we do award the uh, North uh, Civils contract that we have embedded in it the uh, best looking uh, Ontario line we possibly can. Next slide. The maintenance and storage facility, um, when we went through our uh, site selection process, you know, once again, we looked at the entire Ontario line. We went from exhibition all the way through to the uh, Ontario Science Centre. We found uh, nine sites that were candidate sites, which were then shortlisted to three sites. We evaluated these all of these sites against their zoning for industrial use. We wanted to make sure that we were relatively close to the main line to make operations easy and seamless. It had to be large enough to be able to hold the entire fleet, plus 10 trains for uh, future growth. Um, and then we looked at the employment impacts of each one of these uh, sites. And what we found was that uh, as we did that, we, we had certain jobs which we could uh, easily locate within a community. And there were jo those jobs that uh, which were the heavier manufacturing jobs that were A, difficult to locate, relocate, had very expensive processes and, and machinery. And uh, so we took that all into account during our site evaluation process and came up with the current hybrid design um, maintenance and storage facility, which you've seen at many of our virtual open houses, which again includes the north portion of the Thorncliffe Park, as well as the uh, south portion of the Wicksteed industrial area. Um, and uh, that is the, the project that we're working most closely with the business community and uh, the, uh, the community at large um, to be able to deliver. Next slide. So for the north segment, uh, the next thing is the reference concept designs that are going to be coming out, um, as well as uh, refined property impacts. Uh, we're continuing our engagement with the businesses in the area and uh, we'll be reporting on the survey results from the walls, fences and landscaping um, for this area. Next slide. I'm going to pass this to Franca. Thanks very much, Malcolm. So um, it's been uh, it's been a busy virtual year for uh, the community engagement team, um, and we also have been very pleased to uh, to be able to to start especially in the summer and now moving into the fall with an increased uh, opportunity to get out into communities uh, in real life and with uh, some of the team. Um, we have hosted in 2021 um, 16 of these uh, virtual open houses um, with uh, a large number of attendees. And, uh, and what we've also found is that many people even if they don't make it live to the meeting, are participating afterwards and watching some of the uh, content and um, submitting questions. And, and that's really uh, been, been good to see and interesting to see in this virtual uh, time um, with some of the numbers coming out of the engagements uh, really quite, uh, quite high. Um, there have also been um, more paper flyers going out, both for uh, engagement and to create awareness as well as um, some of the smaller pieces of early work and um, early construction um, investigations, that kind of thing, as well as many smaller meetings. So many uh, residents associations and other groups in different neighborhoods along the line have invited um, Metrolinks to your meetings. And we've really very much appreciated um, the opportunity to speak to different groups and different uh, settings up and down along the line. We also have been able 
able to open the community office at Queen Street, and we very much look forward to opening um, the office at Thorncliffe um, in uh, 2022, um, as soon as we're uh, completing all of the, the renos there and, and getting the team fully engaged up in uh, Thorncliffe as well with a second uh, community office. Over to you, Joseph. Next slide. Hello. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you must be, your mouths must be dry because that was a lot of information. Uh, so it is 7.20. I've just been talking to uh, Siva and Mark o or, and Daryl over in the uh, Zoom room. Uh, what we're going to do is do some of the written questions now. I'll be brief uh, in my comment, in my asking the questions, and uh, then we'll go over to the Zoom room to make sure that those people who are here live and have questions that they'd like to ask orally have a chance to do that and don't worry if we don't get to your written question tonight metrolinks has been answering the questions on the site uh, so that everything will be answered the major topics will be addressed and i should just say i missed uh one of our elected representatives when i did the introduction earlier um mpp peter tabins is here with us tonight and he's in the zoom room so we may actually get a question from uh, MPP Tabins a bit later. So the first question, and I think uh, that after 15 of these meetings, and there's been a lot of discussion, um, some people uh, are asking whether or not their voices are being heard. Is the engagement meaningful? And one of the questions that's been asked is whether or not there are examples that you can point to of meaningful change that you have made to the plans or designs of the Ontario line based on the feedback that has been provided by the community previously. Thanks, Joseph. Perhaps I can uh, take a take a go at that one to start. Um, I want to identify that we we have heard, as I uh, just kind of briefly um, identified, we have heard a uh, lots of feedback, and that's really great because um, it it is getting to Metrolinks. We are listening to it, and we are also um, sharing that with uh, the the project delivery team. It it sometimes is difficult to to say, ah, well, we heard this, and so we're going to to build this or to change it in this way. We know specifically, for example, that uh, there still are very real and deep concerns about, um, you know, the maintenance and storage yard, as well as um, the elevated section. And we have to continue to address those concerns uh, through some of the um, through some of the components that are going to continue to progress as the design advances. Um, and I will I will turn it over to Malcolm to give some other specifics, but I do want to just identify that this is a very long and big project and it will take a lot of time. So we are uh, very much going to change over uh, the coming months and years some of the different formats for that engagement and um, and that may mean we change the way we listen, and that may also mean it changes the way we incorporate some of that feedback. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Malcolm to just identify some of the more specific ways. Uh, but I can say that we, uh, we are definitely um, having lots of engagement and identifying some of those concerns that the community is uh, definitely bringing forward. Thank you. Thanks, Franca. Um, yeah, so uh, Frank is absolutely right. Um, your your efforts to share your thoughts with us, um, they they are heard, and uh, we 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 try to as best we can um, try to frame them up so that we can get some good outcome as a result of your engagement. Um, some examples of uh, good outcomes as a result of engagement is uh, through the joint corridor. Um, a significant effort has gone into uh, building that corridor in such a fashion that A, number one, um, uh, construction access is not through the parks or is, is as um, undisruptive as possible through the community. We're using main streets to access those construction sites. 
Um, as well, uh, we've we've made the parks bigger, and that was uh, in a direct response to uh, understanding the community uh, and and the fact that uh, park space in this community is vital. It's what makes uh, this community as vibrant as as it is along the uh, the railway line. So, um, you know, we we heard we heard your your voices. And, and we put the effort to uh, try and, and have a better outcome as a result. The next item that was uh, a, a direct result of your input is um, the noise and vibration mitigation. Um, we, we took that and, and we took it even further. We, we, we made it continuous and uh, we, we, ma we made it uh, su successful in the fact that it actually is going to reduce noise in the neighborhood. And that was, uh, that's that's a, a really an above and beyond uh, approach to noise mitigation um, in a direct response to uh, the elected officials and the community and the voices that we heard, and uh, and we're we're happy to be delivering on that um, on on behalf of uh, the community. So at that, uh, pass it back to you, Joseph. Okay, thank you for those examples, Malcolm. Um, the maintenance and storage facility is high profile and controversial and there is a question from people there uh, who've uh, assembled 10,000 signatures uh, from community members uh, opposing the MSF and the question is um, does does this count at what point do these signatures start to matter um, do you have any substantive responses uh, to these people and any concessions that you are able to make to the people in Thorncliffe Park? Well, I can I can I can start that that discussion for sure. Um, yes, so we're we're very well aware of the opposition to the maintenance and storage facility, and that opposition would have existed with absolutely any maintenance and storage facility in any location where we put it. So what we've done is, and I explained it uh, during the presentation, is we went through a very strict site selection process, and we evaluated all of the options that we had and created a hybrid solution to uh, uh, be able to minimize the impact to the jobs and maximize in, in uh, the, uh, the ability for us to deliver the Ontario line on time. Um, the fact is, is that uh, with our, our business relocation program, um, almost all of these jobs are going to be relocated with in the community, and an additional 200 to 300 jobs are going to be created as a result of the maintenance and storage facility being built there. The, um, the, the I don't believe that there is any resistance to uh, transit coming to the community. The community seems to be very supportive of that, and that linkage to um, the greater Toronto area and access to jobs are vitally important to this community and any community that we're uh, building a new station in. So. We do hear the community. We're going to great efforts uh, to mitigate any of the impacts associated with the building of the maintenance and storage facility. We took uh, uh, two bus loads of community members to other maintenance and storage facilities and, and showed them um, what's good, what's possible, and listened to them to see what we could do uh, better. And uh, those things are all being built into the plans for the new maintenance and storage facility. We're also making sure with our alignment selection that uh, we're impacting uh, Overly as little as possible. We're we're dipping off of Overly as, as, as quickly as we can. And um, as a result, um, we get to get back to uh, that industrial area and, and build the maintenance and storage facility, part of the maintenance and storage facility there. Joseph, back to you. Okay, let me ask a related question, and thank you for that answer, Malcolm. A, a related question, and that regards the local business community. Um, and this was the most voted for question as we came into the meeting. And do you have, with the maintenance and storage facility going in there and the disruption, do you have a plan for how to uh, relocate businesses to help them to remain in the area and to keep it vibrant? Thanks, Joseph. Uh, it's Natasha here. I can speak to that one. 
Um, so yes, we do have a plan. And as Malcolm had noted, um, we've talked to all of the affected business owners and community organizations um, in the area. And basically what happens is once there's a confirmed requirement, so Malcolm talked about looking at different options. Once we confirm what the requirements are for the project, that's when we start talking to owners and businesses. And so as we've um, started having these conversations earlier this year, we've started to understand what the needs are for relocation and what we can do to support all of the businesses and, and organizations. So that's that's a plan that we've been working on developing over the last few months. So that, that involves dealing with each business on an individual basis? Correct, exactly. Okay, thank you for that. Related, uh, property owners, uh, people who are there, uh, the issue of expropriation, uh, how people's properties will be affected comes up repeatedly. And uh, there were, again, a couple questions that have come up for tonight about asking when you'll be able to give uh, property owners um, the precise dimensions of the transit corridor, a sense of exactly where it'll be, how much land you'll need, and when the affected homeowners uh, will learn more about the timing and the process to deal with their properties. Sure, I can answer that too, Joseph. Um, so basically, once the technical design has gone into a certain stage where we can identify what the requirements are for the project, so for example, a station entrance or the tunnel or an emergency exit building perhaps, that's when we will know what we need for the project and that's when we start to talk to owners. So as Malcolm had noted throughout the presentation, the design is in different stages and so for the south, the downtown stations, we've already started talking to owners there. Whereas with the north, as the design progresses, that's when we'll be able to start reaching out to owners. But we like to do that as soon as we have confirmed requirements. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, when you were talking about the downtown portion and the area where people are right now, um, there was a lot of construction going on. Um, and there is the question about uh, construction effects. Uh, will businesses, in particular along Queen Street, Sherborne, will businesses be able to remain open during the construction? And if so, uh, will you be creating any kind of accessible paths so that people who have accessibility requirements will be able to uh, access those businesses. And of course, because construction on a day-to-day -day basis churns up dust, debris, um, do you have a plan to actually maintain and keep those areas clean uh, so that people during that period of time will be able to access the area? Well, I can start the answer and then I'll pass it over to Richard, but um, without a doubt, we're making our plans to be able to keep all of the businesses open. We're developing construction means and methods um, that are not uh, generally open cuts in the middle of the street. Um, we're trying to move to um, uh, sequential excavation methods to mine some of our stations, which allows us to keep a lot of our construction in the sites where the entrances are going to be, the future entrances are going to be built. So all of that combines to make the uh, the impact of construction much, much less. Um, we're expecting all of our uh, sidewalks to remain open or, or relocated. So the accessibility element will be there. Um, so we, we are expecting that uh, the uh, impact on businesses is, is going to be very minor and that we're actually uh, going to be able to do most of our construction with, with almost no impact to businesses. With respect to the uh, noise, vibration, and dust, I'll pass that to Richard. Hey, Malcolm, thanks very much. We, yes, the noise, vibration, and dust, of course, are uh, you know always concerns with construction. Uh, but Metrolinx has very strict systems that we operate with our contractors to uh, ensure that that uh, these noxious influences from the construction sites are controlled as much as possible. Uh, we do have a reporting system that uh, is made available to local residents in case there's a, a concern about noise or safety, dust or debris. 
um, that, that they can report 24 hours a day. Uh, we do have a very strict set of criteria for noise and vibration that contractors are held to. Uh, we have uh, automatic monitoring systems that uh, that uh, keep an eye on those sites uh, 24 hours a day, and we're we're advised of any uh, variances to the standards that we've set uh, for uh, you know daytime or night evening or nighttime hours. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, dust, um, dirt on the streets, we do have wheel washes uh, that so the trucks don't uh, track mud out onto the streets. And uh, in, in the event that anything does happen, we, you know, we have street cleaners engaged, uh, street sweepers, cleaners, uh, machinery engaged to clean up any mess that might occur uh, or get past those truck, truck rates and wheel washes. Um, so with that, back to you, Joseph. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Richard, for people as they observe something or want to get in touch with you, uh, there's a contact us button at the top of this page and a telephone number. Uh, does that telephone number put them in touch so they can deal with their any issues they may have about construction related uh, issues as it comes along? Or is that another number that they would find somewhere? I, I think that there's a separate number for that. Um, I think... Uh, you know, and where would I go to find that, Richard? I, I think it, it was, as far as I know, it's posted on the it will be posted on our website. And uh, oh, actually, Frank tells me it is the same number. So okay, uh, there you go. Um, so that's four one six two zero two fifty one hundred. Yep, there you go. Okay. And uh, essentially, there is uh, that will be posted on on the uh, sites themselves, so uh, people have reference to it easily. And uh, as you can see, it's also here on the uh, slide in front of us, and uh, it's on the MetroLink's website. So there's uh, always a way to get in touch with us uh, 24 hours a day. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Now. Uh, it's 25 to 8, and the presentation, which was chock full of good information, it, ra it ran a little over time. So what I'm going to do now is let's go over to the Zoom room. There's the button there that uh, you can join the Zoom room. And I understand that Daryl and Siva have several people who have their hands up and who have been waiting for an opportunity to ask a question orally. So Daryl, Siva, can you hear me? Yes. Um, can you hear us? Okay. Over to you. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, we have a list, of, a long list of people who are interested in, in asking a question, and we'll start with Brian, who has a question about exhibition and streetcars. Oh, um, Jessica, um, Brian, uh, you're, you'll need to unmute yourself when I um, when you get the little notification. Okay, should be clear now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you uh, for another great presentation from the team. Um, I live in the uh, Concord City Place and uh, Liberty Village area, so uh, nearest station is likely to be exhibition. Uh, and I've been following the details of the planning, so um, it's coming along, I think, very well. So we're going to have essentially three forms of transit coming together in one spot. Uh, we've got the GO train, of course, and then the beginning of the relief line, or sorry, the Ontario line. Um, my question deals specifically with the TTC uh, streetcar system that comes into exhibition. Um, the station itself is uh, quite large and the uh, offloading and onloading is um, a little further east than I thought it would be. Um, is there any plans to redesign the TTC uh, intersection or interaction stations a little better so they're closer to the uh, GO station entry, um, closer to the Ontario line itself, and I guess closer to the stadium entrance? Super, Brian. Uh, great question. Thank you. Um, so yes, we are absolutely working very closely with the TTC on their plans. They actually have plans to extend their uh, streetcar uh, beyond the loop uh, over to uh, Dufferin, which will provide a, a different opportunity for a, a station and engagement with the Ontario Line Go Transit as well as Exhibition Place. So that uh, conversation is very active right now. Um, the other interesting thing uh, is that it's, it's also the bus network coming in. So we're working quite closely with the city on a new Liberty Street on the uh, north side of the rail corridor 
and we're planning for uh, good, convenient uh, bus laybys there to be able to drop passengers off to a get down to the waterfront exhibition as well as the Ontario Line and Go Transit as well as the streetcar network. So. It is uh, certainly a body of work that we're working quite closely with the city and TTC on uh, this very important interchange station. Thank you for your question, Brian. Okay, next up we have Monica. Monica, can you unmute yourself? Oh, there we go, okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very excited about this project. We've needed improvement in our transit in a very long time. Um, the one thing I would like to talk about, because I think we're only really allowed one question, is um, my big concern is accessibility. Um, I have arthritic knees and hips, um, and I am quite capable of using public transit. I do not require wheel-trans, so I don't want people to jump to that conclusion. However, the question was asked, there was one sentence in response about accessibility that it would be accessible, the construction. That's not acceptable. You spent minutes upon minutes upon minutes talking about dust, talking about businesses, and talking about, you know, making sure the traffic is flowing properly. I need to make sure that you guys are aware of the fact that accessibility is huge in this. Too many times there have been fixes around construction that do not take accessibility into effect. For instance, that bridge that you seem to have going over Exhibition Place, that looks like a bunch of stairs to me. I don't see an elevator or ramps there anywhere. Um, I have no idea how you guys are going to make the sidewalks accessible. Uh, when you're doing the construction, I understand that it's important that the businesses stay open, but if people with accessibility issues can't get into them, then that's a huge problem. Um, I, I, I can't express how important this is and how it always gets shoved under the rug. I was a member of the Toronto Accessibility Committee at City Hall, and people come to that committee after the planning has been done, which is useless. So I really hope that accessibility is in your top three things that you are considering with every step that this takes. Because as the population gets older, this is going to become more and more of a problem. So can you assure me that it's not going to be a one sentence of, and it will be accessible, when you're thinking about all of these things? So Monica, uh, it's Malcolm. Uh, gr great question. I'm glad you pointed it out. Um, so, uh, you know, our commitment, commitment to accessibility is, is uh, from uh, the beginning of construction all the way through construction into the final built form. So, uh, you know, I, I, I could go on to great lengths about uh, how the final built form um, is completely accessible, you know, follows all the necessary guidelines and, and legislation for accessibility. Um, but you know you're right, absolutely right. During construction, uh, there's there's changes, there's there's elevation changes. Sometimes um, sidewalks are moved into the street, and there has to be a program that's very rigorously applied to ensure that you know all of the safety uh, and ramp slopes and things like that are maintained. And and ac accessibility is is not an option for us. Uh, it is it is it is absolutely a mandatory. Um, Richard and his team are are putting together uh, plans um, with the future projects and are building into the what we call project specific output specifications, and those will uh, ensure that um, accessibility is maintained for uh, the entire population during our construction period. So. We do have advisors in-house that review our work for uh, accessibility, very similar to the way TTC has their a ACAT. And um, anyways, I, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you highlighting it to us. And I, you know, I, I apologize for um, just answering that it will be accessible, but you're right to highlight the importance of that accessibility and the efforts that will go into it. Um, 
So uh, we do appreciate your question. Franca, did you want to talk a little bit about the community outreach and community communication around accessibility uh, during construction? Sure, sure. Uh, thanks. And thanks for the question, because I, I think there are a lot of um, there are a lot of, of lessons that we've learned Metrolinks from other projects. Um, uh, for example, there was a lot of work uh, during the uh, Eglinton Crosstown with, uh, with CNIB and lots of information that was gathered by uh, some of the community team that was able to be incorporated into specific sites. Um, such a, things such as um, for people with visual impairment, you know, some of the, the signage around sites, making sure that you know the corners were the were rounded instead of hard edges um uh, tactile issues um the footings of fences are always problematic around construction sites so uh, there has to be this continuous loop to ensure that the footings are um are well stabilized and not uh, obstructed so that um there can be there can be movement around them so i think there are a lot of these kind of really granular things that we will be able to um, have as feedback um, through construction liaison groups as construction does ramp up, um, as well as, of course, uh, all of the the longer term um, accessibility um, features within the stations themselves. But during construction, certainly there is a lot. And uh, and I would encourage people who are living around stations to um, to uh, continue to be in touch with Metrolinks as the construction liaison groups get started closer to construction to make sure that we're addressing all those concerns. And yeah. I'll, I'll just add uh, an, another point uh, that um, uh, Monica mentioned was the Bridget exhibition. The Bridget exhibition is uh, an additional uh, pedestrian pathway um, to provide additional um, support to special events um, and uh, but a, a accessible path will always be maintained the bridge may not be accessible um, but it, it is meant as an overflow condition but uh, there will always be an accessible route across the corridor but and and you know one other thing that I, I just want to highlight is that you know sometimes the above and beyond approach is the way that we approach accessibility and, and we're doing that with our uh, elevators um, you know, we're required to have an elevator to get to platform level. We're actually building two elevators to get to platform level to make sure that we have redundancy specifically for that accessibility issue. So um, your voice is, is heard and, uh, you know, and, and, and thank, thank you for that, uh, that very good challenging question. Back to you, Joseph, or uh, Sipa Hami, sorry. Thank you, Malcolm. Next up, we have MPP Tavins with a question about noise. Okay, thank you very much and thanks for the presentation this evening. I have a lot of questions, but I'll just go to one. Uh, in the document on the early works, there was a lot of description or discussion of mitigation to reduce impact of noise while the work was going on. And particularly because we're gonna have work going on through the night along the rail line for the above ground section. Uh, we were given a lot of assurances that, in fact, we would have sophisticated protocols that would be able to deal with the issue. I've just recently been getting complaints from people on Unity Road, which is by Greenwood, where Greenwood meets the rail corridor, uh, whose street is being used as a staging area for construction, for construction trucks bringing in materials, taking out materials. And what they're reporting to me is that from seven in the evening until uh, well, I guess through the night, they've got trucks sitting on their street idling. Uh, they've, these are the large trucks carrying construction materials and the vehicles of the construction workers on their street idling. Uh, so they have constant noise on top of the construction work itself. Now, I understood that you would have a no idling policy uh, during the construction period, uh, which I thought was a good policy, but it doesn't seem to be getting enforced or even thought about. So I have to ask, why should we have confidence that you will actually work aggressively to reduce noise problems for people along the Ontario line when these early works commence, when we can see today, Metro links further along the rail line, acting in a way that makes life extraordinarily difficult for the people beside their construction project. So um, 
MPP Tobbins, uh, thank you. I, I believe you're making reference to the email you sent to us today. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, we, yeah, thank you. Um, we are absolutely looking into that. Um, you know, the, that, that project is, is not related to the work that we're undertaking as part of the Ontario line, but your, your linkage to um, uh, us is, is fair. And uh, we, we, we take this seriously. Uh, we will be looking into it uh, uh, and uh, reporting back to you and the community member who's, uh, who's been bothered by this. And we will certainly share the results of that. Um, we are by no means perfect, um, and, uh, but we, we do strive for perfection. And, uh, you know, we, we take every call that we get seriously and we make sure that we have uh, means and methods for us to be able to impose the rules that our contractors have bid to so that um, we, we, we abide by the agreements that we have with the communities in which we're doing our work. So um, I do appreciate you bringing it to our attention. We will be responding to it uh, immediately and, uh, and, and we'll be sharing the results of our, our investigation with you. Back to you, Siva Hami. I have a question from Reva, and she's asking about St. Michael's Hospital on Queen and Church. Reva's question is, how will that area be accessed by emergency vehicles if it is closed to cars during construction? So I can, I can start with that and, and then pass it over to Richard to talk about the construction. But um, what we've done is we've, we've made sure that we have routing to all of the businesses as well as the services and hospitals in the area um, that are, are viable and uh, are, are not significantly delayed. Um, there's a lot of modeling that has gone into this particular closure. And uh, it's, it's probably the most modeled construction site that has happened in Toronto in, in years. Um, so, uh, you know, we can, we can be rest assured that uh, we've worked quite closely with the City of Toronto on evaluating all of the uh, opportunities and, and methods of construction in order to execute this, this station. Uh, construction and uh, and we have uh, had discussions with uh, St. Michael's Hospital to be able to uh, share with them the plans and the fact that uh, all of their entrances remain accessible during the entire construction period. Richard, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I think I think the the closure of Queen Street in that area is, is only between Young and Victoria. Both uh, Victoria and Young remain fully open, as does Queen Street uh, east of, of uh, Victoria. Uh, part of our traffic modeling involved looking at uh, emergency services, uh, you know, ambulance and uh, police and fire response um, to ensure that, uh, you know, access to all the buildings in that area could be maintained, particularly the hospital, of course. Um, and that uh, we, we've taken particular care of that little, those two little blocks between Queen and Victoria and uh, Queen and Bay, uh, there is, we've ensured there's no, there's no access to businesses there for businesses or the hospital uh, off of those streets themselves. So uh, we wouldn't be blocking any, any access uh, to parking garage or loading dock or, you know, emergency department or anything like that. So, uh, so that, that was taken into account when, when we looked at exactly where to put, where to put those closures. So back, back to the zoom room, I think. Thanks Richard. Um, next up we have, um, Katie and, um, Katie, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Katie Krelov. I uh, live just north of Fort York, uh, the corner of Wellington and Niagara. Um, and it's a very, it's a residential neighborhood that over the past, I'd say five years has seen a huge increase in traffic. So people are more and more using the sort of Strawn Wellington uh, by, as a way to bypass Lakeshore, as a way to bypass King Street, as a way to bypass Queen Street. And um, this is uh, my 
third community consultation in the past month because there are several large construction projects planned for this residential neighborhood that will affect traffic even more. And every time I ask about the considerations of traffic for this particular little bypass on Wellington, no one seems to have any answers. Uh, so we've got the uh, Destructor, 655 Wellington Destructor that's going in next door in the next few years. We've got the TAF um, condo village that's going in on the former abattoir site and stacked and site that's currently the stacked market. I mean, we've already seen traffic increases from the huge amount of condos going in on Strawn around Liberty Village. Um, and I get, you know, and, and just to put it in context, um, Queen Street was shut down this past weekend and, and still is uh, for track renewal. And I literally sat in my front yard and watched back to back, bumper to bumper cars on my tiny little street for five hours on Saturday. And I mean, this is a neighborhood that is increasing in foot traffic and bike traffic, and all of that is, all of that traffic, all of that traffic, that bike and foot traffic is put in danger, frankly, by these increases in traffic. So, I mean, I'm just very, very, very concerned what happens when the Ontario Line Exhibition Place construction is happening at the same time as the 655 Wellington uh, construction is going on at the same time that the abattoir condo development is happening in my back alleyway and what this is going to do for traffic in our neighborhood. And I really just can't get any answers. Um, and so I guess my question is, my specific questions are one, like what will Lakeshore be shut down? Well, the exhibition, um, uh, station is being built when will that be and how when who like what is the process for coordination between all of these different construction process projects if any like is Metrolinx going to coordinate with TAF who's constructing the abattoir and the 99 like is there going to be coordination in terms of, of, of management of traffic between all of these different projects that from what I can tell are all going to be happening at the same time? Katie, it's Malcolm. Um, obviously a good question. And uh, we work uh, quite closely with the uh, city of Toronto who coordinates the greater municipality, the, the, the city work that's going on and, and as well as issues permits for those constructions. We are we are tied into them incredibly deeply on all of our, our work, our haul routes and our, our construction practices. We have a um, our, our um, resolution going to council in December that talks about the downtown section, the construction and uh, the Queen Street Road closure, as well as uh, the uh, uh, some of the other lane impediments that are going to be happening sporadically throughout the construction period. Um, without a doubt, we, uh, you know, we, as as Richard said, we have our our, our hotline four one six two zero two fifty one hundred. If there's ever any issues, um, I'm going to tap on Richard to talk about haul routes and that sort of thing during construction. But those things will also be developed with our, our construction uh, contractors when they come on board um, because they don't want to be stuck um, in traffic. They don't want to be driving down little streets. They, 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 they want to as effectively get to their destinations and flow. Uh, so the, um, th there's without a doubt uh, a coordination effort that happens. Um, with us, with the municipality, and through that with the other construction projects. So, um, you know, what we can say is, is um, stay tuned when our contractor comes on board, and we'll be able to uh, talk to you further about the details of the haul routes and 
Richard, maybe you can just talk maybe a little bit about the, about the project specific output specifications and, and how we're able to uh, um, manage and direct our, our contractors on safe practices. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So it's a good question, uh, one that always comes up with construction. Um, and as you know, we, part part of uh, our work is that we do model uh, the traffic impacts as part as part of our construction work. Uh, and as Malcolm said, we've done a, a very thorough modeling of the downtown that takes account of uh, the known works that are, are are on the books at this point in time. Um, the uh, to refer to the lakeshore there there is no intent to close lakeshore or affect lakeshore in any way as part of the exhibition construction um and uh, in fact the uh, access for exhibition station would actually be via dufferin for the hall route so the you the very short little piece of street there to get out onto the uh, gardner expressway uh so so again we we try to plan the routes uh so they do not interfere with the local neighborhoods to the greatest extent possible. Um, and uh, one of the things that we do require as part of uh, any of the contractors work is a traffic management plan, which they, which the contractors have to work with the city of Toronto. Obviously Metrolinx is there as part, as part of the team um, developing these traffic management plans with the city of Toronto transportation uh, department and uh, making sure that uh, you know the 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 hall routes in out uh, and is are taken care of um, and and properly managed. Um, uh, we you know we we uh, work with the city of Toronto. We as Malcolm says the for condos and things that's uh, the permitting is within the purview of the city. Um, but we do you know when we develop the detailed traffic management plans, we do take account of what we know about at the time. And, and I think Casey. That's, Katie, one other uh, element is, uh, you know, your your issue is is exactly why we're building the Ontario line. We're providing an attractive alternative to the car and to get people out of cars so that they they can get downtown faster and easier without driving. So, um, you know, I, we we do recognize that it's a long construction period, but the ultimate goal is to get uh, get those twenty seven thousand cars a day off of the road. So that uh, uh, your your streets are in fact quieter as a result. So hopefully our our ambitions are are aiming in the right direction, and our implementation will uh, satisfy you uh, with respect to the construction traffic in your neighborhood. Joseph, back to you. Yes, thank you for that answer and those questions. Now. I'm just jumping in because uh, we are at our scheduled end time, but I understand there are a number of people who are have their hands raised in the Zoom room and have not yet had a chance to ask a question. So with our speakers and our panelists' approval, we're going to go an extra few minutes to try and get through some of those questions. I also understand that some of the questioners may not be able to stay uh, for an extra period of time. So if you're in the Zoom room and if you have a question, uh, the question and answer on the website on Metrolinks Engage where the video is, that is still open. And you can always just type in your question there and the Metrolinks team will see that and they'll respond to it in writing with the other questions. So um, let's go back to uh, Siva and Daryl for a few more questions. Uh, and if you can't wait to ask your question, type it in and you will get a response. So back to you, Siva, and thank you to the panelists for agreeing to stay for a few more minutes. Thanks, Joseph. Next up, we have Rosemary from the Lakeshore East Community Advisory Committee. So Rosemary is calling in from her phone. So I'm just, um, uh, Rosemary, or did you get the notification to unmute yourself on your phone? Hello. Oh, Hi, go. thanks for taking my call. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about the section that's above ground from the Don River to Girard, um, which you're currently planning to have underground, I'm uh, having overground, hope it's going to go underground, but just in case it stays above ground on the rail corridor, I want to talk about sound. Um, Malcolm, you mentioned that the sound levels are going to be the same or lower than they are currently. And I've heard that claim before, and I just need to protest that again. While a single pass of a train might be slightly lower, slightly quieter in some of the places that you did your tests, not all, but some, 
it might be slightly quieter for one train, you're continuing to not acknowledge that currently we have 170 trains that go by on that rail corridor every day. But when this project is complete, that number is going to be 1,500 trains a day. So one might be slightly quieter, but when one goes by right now, all conversation stops because you can't hear yourself think. So it might be a little bit quieter by 2030, but we're gonna have 1,500 a day. It's going to be constant sound. So my question is about your noise mitigation. In your early works report, you only talk about transparent noise walls. I want to know, is that the most sound absorbent material that is in use anywhere in the world on a transit project? And if it's not, what is the most sound absorbent material that we could have? We don't want transparent unless it's the very best for absorbing sound. That's all we care about is you're going to go right through a residential neighborhood, through neighborhood parks. You're basically destroying our community. We want the most sound mitigation we can get. What is the most absorbent material that is out there? So that's my question. Thank you. Rosemary, uh, I will start and then I'll pass it to James our environmental expert. Um, so uh, first off, um, there is a uh, round of engagement that we've already had. Uh, a survey went out uh, regarding the noise walls and the, the uh, retaining walls, but there is a further round of engagement uh, where we're going to be um, getting a community table together uh, to be able to talk about these exact same things. So. Um, yeah, there are um, more absorbent uh, uh, sound walls with, uh, without a doubt, and, and James can talk to those. Um, but there, there, there are uh, pluses and minuses to, to each selection. So that is uh, the debate and the, and the discussion that we would like to have with the community to make sure that we have the best possible outcome. And uh, so that, that's very good. Um, I think James is probably also going to talk about the noise modeling that has been done and they they modeled both average noises as well as um, passbys and uh, they modeled the number of trains today versus the number of trains in the future and uh, they you know James can share with you the the results of, of, of that investigation but as as we've been saying, the um, outcome of those uh, that those noise modeling results, both in the pass by and the average, are showing an improvement as a result of the noise barriers that we've planned, with the height that we've planned, with the number of vehicles that will be going by, with the technologies that we're going to be implementing. Um, all of those things have been taken into account in the modeling exercise. So, um, James, would you like to elaborate a little further on that? Absolutely. Thank, thanks very much, Malcolm. And, and just to build a bit on, on what Malcolm's saying, Rosemary, um, our, our noise modeling for the joint corridor, it looks at uh, not just the single train pass by, which, which we're required to look at under our under our protocols with the Ministry of the Environment. We, we looked at all of the anticipated uh, train trips go in Ontario line. So, so it's, it's really, a, it's, it's almost a cumulative view of all of the daytime, all of the, all of the later in the day trips. And our modeling results show that the noise levels will be lower um, looking looking at all of that. So not just on the single pass by, but the, the overall noise levels will be will be reduced. Um, and in that report, you know, if, 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 if you got into the details of the of the report in your review, you you would have noticed our modeling looks at um, you know certain certain noise wall heights to to achieve reductive to achieve reductions and, and we're getting reductions at, at locations along the corridor. So improved conditions compared to today. We also committed to a minimum noise barrier height of five meters, which will improve conditions even beyond what we're showing in the report. So noise levels will, will be lower and they'll be even lower than, than we're showing in the report. Uh, as Malcolm mentioned, there, there, there are a variety of options for noise walls. So, so we look at transparent in the report, uh, very much interested in the community input on, on what, the, what the noise walls will, will, will kind of look and feel like. Uh, and, 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 and we can work through that and, and see uh, what the right balance is, what the right trade-offs are, and what the best, best solution is for the community in terms of in terms of the ultimate look and feel of the noise balls. We're very much looking forward to, to ongoing discussions. Siva Hamid, would so back much. to you. Thanks, Malcolm and James. Um, uh, Daryl, do you want to actually introduce the next person? Uh, 
<laughs> Thanks. I'm glad to have Hayden with us again. Uh, go ahead, Hayden, and unmute to ask your question. Okay, thanks. Can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, so as a urban and regional planning student at Ryerson, um, we are taught about to know about the population who are often ignored um, in this consultation process. So I just want to know, um, what matching, like, um, how would the Ontario line benefit the children population, which is around you know, one, one fifth of the population in Toronto? Um, and, and what is metric engagement strategy on the children population? Maybe I can kick us off. Um, I think it's a, an interesting question and, and I, uh, I'm not sure it's one we've had before, so I really appreciate the, uh, that. Um, I think one thing is in terms of engagement with um, with children or with with uh, different demographics, um, you know, one thing is how do we how do we get our message out and how do we engage? And it's always going to be a balance, and it always should be um, in terms of methods because you're never going to capture everybody with one method. But I think that um, we at Metrolinks are are um, conscious that we need to reach. Um, younger generations and students through some of our engagement. So we actually have um, an agreement with uh, the Toronto District and Toronto Catholic District School Boards um, for bringing information into the schools. Transit in Your Community is the name of the program. Um, obviously getting into schools right now is, is is continues to be a challenge so we are trying to adjust that program virtually um, to share information about the program and it fits with the curriculum um, grade five and nine in particular um, and we've worked hard with uh, tdsb and tcdsb over the last few years to establish that project um, and i think we're excited to continue to roll it out um, and and sort of build that build that enthusiasm for the project. Um, it also uh, provides an opportunity for connection with uh, people who might want to go into um, planning or engineering or the trades. Um, and that's an uh, interesting um, opportunity too. So um, I appreciate the question. And of course, you know, people who are, who are younger now and students are going to be um, living through the construction but then ultimately quite big beneficiaries and we'll, we'll take for granted the Ontario line once it's up and running um, and will uh, be integrated into the fabric of their lives um, but I think um, a mixture of outreach this transit in your community programs are all ways that we're trying to engage with uh, with students. Thanks Franca. Uh, we have a question now from Marion about um, parkland around Coxwell and Queen. Marion, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, she muted herself again. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, hi. I live in um, Corktown, actually, so I'm going to have to put up with the construction around the Corktown station. But I was just hiking in the um, section that Riva was talking about today with all the parkland there. And um, I don't really want to lose that green space. And um, I noticed that there's ribbons on trees and things from the neighborhood protesting that the train would go through there above ground. Why couldn't you put it underground, like under the Coxwell Avenue or Cape or whatever? So Marion, I, I, I can answer that question. Yep, okay. uh, it's Malcolm. Uh, yes, um, so um, we, what we have done is we've been um, staking uh, out um, uh, through the joint corridor, um, the toe of the future uh, uh, T-wall so that uh, we can dispel any myths that we were going into the parkland in any significant way. As, as we presented in the materials, um, by and large, the parks are going to be getting larger after our build um, as a result of uh, moving the walls uh, towards the, um, the, the rail corridor. That will create additional space um, in, in the parks. So 
that's why we're working quite closely with uh, the uh, City of Toronto and the Toronto Parks and Forestry to develop uh, and animate those spaces and program those spaces in the best way possible. So that discussion is, is ongoing. It's going to involve a, a large community, community engagement element so that we can make sure that uh, we deliver uh, an outcome that is as best as possible for the, uh, the community. As for undergrounding, um, uh, some of our virtual, other virtual open houses, we, uh, we discussed the undergrounding options that uh, were studied both as the Relief Flying South and uh, other options um, and, uh, and you know, found that the, the benefits associated with an undergrounding uh, were, were not necessarily uh, evident. Um, the costs were much higher. And uh, the business case um, would have would have been compromised as a result of, of that undergrounding. So, um, as well as the fact that um, you know some of those benefits that we talked about, you know, the building of the noise walls um, in a corridor that is currently not got noise walls is is going to be uh, beneficial to the the noise uh, transmission uh, through that corridor. So. We, 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 we certainly are, uh, as the Ontario line, are, are progressing the design um, using the lands that are available so that we um, don't impact more properties um, as a result. So um, that's kind of the, the long answer to, to, to your, your question. Siva Hami, back to you. Thank you for that, Malcolm. And Siva, I believe we're now at 8.15 and we've asked people uh, to stay over time. Uh, so we can probably squeeze in two more questions. And uh, for anyone who does not get your question, the site is still open and you can ask your question in the written questions area afterwards and it will be seen and it will be responded to. So, um, We've just had a number of people who've come in and put their hands up recently, so I'm afraid we won't be able to get to all of you, but we can do two more questions. Siva? And Joseph, I'll also add to that that everyone is also welcome to email us at ontarioline at metrolinks.com, and we can set up an individual phone call or an individual video meeting with you so that we can answer your questions one-on-one -on -one if we don't get to your question tonight. Um, next up, we have F. Lewis. Um, F. Lewis, would you like to unmute? Hi there. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, my questions with regards to the two stations that are going in at Queen and Spadina. I've got a, a, a zoning, a rezoning document that was created by Metrolinx that shows those two stations, each with a 15-story multi-use, basically condo slash office building on the top. Metrolinx is supposed to be a transportation company. When is it, why is it in the real estate business now? So I, I, I can answer that question. Um, so as part of the delivery of um, transit, um, we we buy extensive uh, amounts of property, and uh, what we've done is we're working quite closely with Infrastructure Ontario to uh, be able to uh, take those lands that uh, that we purchase and be able to uh, provide some level of intensification around the station. Um, you know, those stations are are very big investments, and they they absolutely. Um, uh, are are in prime locations where where people want to live, and um, the transit-oriented community program uh, that's being administered by IO. So you can go to ioengage.com um, to find out about the transit-oriented community. But Metrolinx is delivering the transit portion of that that program, and uh, that includes the uh, stations. Um, the overbuilds and the developments are, are the follow-on um, investments made uh, by Infrastructure Ontario in, in delivering that vision for uh, those sites. Back to you, Siva Hami. Okay, our last question is from Dimitro. Dimitro, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation, first of all. Uh, you sort of skipped over Cosburn Station. You went from Pape straight to the Don Valley overpass. And my question is, is the location of Cosburn Station, which is west of Pape Avenue, is it final? I understand the rationale that by positioning Cosburn Station west of the street, fewer of the buried utilities will, will need to be relocated, including the recently upgraded water main. But also, the thing is, the way it's positioned now, the very heart of Pape Village will be destroyed. And that's barbecue shop, barber shop, laundry, laundromat, money mart, dry cleaners, convenience, pharmacy, medical center, cafe, wine rack, wireless shop, and so forth. Canada Post branch already closed. Scotia Bank branch already closed because of that. Uh, so as opposed to uh, the other side of the street where there is essentially a McDonald's and the parking lot, which could accommodate most of the stations. So my question is, is it final? Is there a way that this location could be reconsidered in order to keep the heart of the neighborhood of the community and not turn it into essentially, into essentially a corridor, you know? Because now there's, it's a nexus where people come to shop and it'll, it'll destruction of that block of uh, stores will turn it into a corridor ascension. Right. Um, yes. So thank you, Dimitri. That's a good question. So <clears throat> right now, uh, Cosburn is one of our least developed uh, stations. We did look at um, East and West and in Pape Avenue as alternatives for construction. Right now, our evaluation is showing that we're better to be west of Pape with the um, uh, with the build, and um, you know th what happens is is following the build as as we uh, we talked about in the, the previous question, there is an opportunity to um, uh, reinvest and 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 reinvent um, the site that uh, the station is being built in. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we're moving out of the corridor to build this is it allows us to exactly, as you said, um, not impact um, the very uh, utilities that you mentioned, um, as well as the uh, surface transit as, and, and the, uh, the road network. So those things all play into our decision making process, which has landed us where we are today. Um, we will certainly, um, in our next posting, we, we haven't spoken extensively about Cosburn Station for, for the very reason that we're still working on that station. You know, the, uh, the north uh, part of the alignment is the least developed of our, 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 our work, and that's only because it's the last one that's going out to tender. So uh, stay tuned. Um, we will certainly be bringing to you in early 2022, more information on this whole section of the alignment. And with that, I will pass it back to Joseph. Well, thank you for that, Malcolm. And thank you to everyone who asked the question and thank you to the panelists. And I think as Malcolm just alluded to, this is not the end of the process. Uh, Metrolinx continues to engage with the community on an ongoing basis. Uh, earlier, you heard uh, references to the sound demonstration to the first Parliament Site Heritage Interpretation Commemoration Survey. If you click on the Get Engaged green button at just above the video, you can find both of those in the sidebar. If you click on the live meetings button, you can see um, recordings of all of the previous meetings plus the questions and answers. You can also contact Metrolinx using the contact us uh, button and there's a book a meeting button. Metrolinx is here, Metrolinx is available and there will be more engagement opportunities. Again, if you didn't have a chance to get your question answered tonight, just write it in now before you sign off uh, and Metrolinx will look at it. The Metrolinx staff will make a, an, an effort to respond to all of the questions or the question areas that were asked uh, so that you'll be able to come back here along with the recording of tonight's session tomorrow. So lots of resources, Metrolinx is not going away. Uh, this is all going to be on the record and there will be another one of these on Thursday night. Um, and uh, so another opportunity to come back if you want to ask a question at that one. Thank you again to everybody. I hope you found that this was a good experience, that your questions were answered, that you got information you can use, and that you feel that Metrolinx is both uh, giving you information and listening and responding. Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe. Good night.